you who like uh, live tweeting things, um, I have a couple of hashtags for you. Obviously, free OK. Um, and real sex ed is the hashtag that I use all the time on Twitter um, to point out why we need sexual health education, um, what isn't sexual health education. Um, and that's you know, what I'm going to be talking about today. If you want to mention me, I am at Emery B. Um, so here we go. Coming up next. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be talking, you know, I know. So some of you are like, I don't get it, what happened? Um, we're a whole bunch of skeptics, I don't need to stand up here and spell out every single reason why abstinence only education totally sucks, because it does, um, it's not based in science, um, it's people just giving their opinions, they're scaring a lot of kids, uh, but I am going to briefly, briefly touch on uh, why it's a skeptic's worst nightmare. Um, and then I'm actually going to do a comprehensive sexuality education presentation for you. Um, that's kind of different. I know a lot of times we have speakers who come up and talk about sex, um, but they aren't really talking about the basics. Um, so we're going to get a little bit of that. You can text me a question at any time. So this is the thing that's difficult a lot of times with sexual health education is people are afraid to ask questions because it's very personal. Um, so today, you're going to be anonymous. I'm not going to be looking up your phone number to see like, where did this number come from. Um, but text me whatever you want. At the end, I'm going to go through um, kind of like I'm picking. Oh, I already have questions. I already see my phone lighting up. Um, <laughs> I know, great. I haven't even done anything yet. Um, I will be picking through questions. I do have to kind of like read them to myself first to make sure I'm not going to say something like, can you make a white Russian with breast milk? I get that <laughs> question. It's like, I, like, let's avoid those types of things. You know what's appropriate. Um, but anytime you have a question, I'll go through and I'll go through at the end. I'll try to get as many people as possible. Um, if you don't have texting capabilities, I know there are some people who don't like having a cell phone on them. Um, if you raise your hand, I can have you shout a question to me because I, I have the microphone now, so I'm not giving it up. Great. Um, so this is something we we've, we've maybe seen. This is from Mean Girls. <laughs> don't have sex because you will get pregnant and you will die. Obviously, that's not true, but that's pretty much what a lot of people are told in abstinence only until marriage programs, which is quite a mouthful. Um, these programs are making people feel terrible about their sexuality. We are born sexual beings, we die sexual beings, and that's okay. That's what we're, su we're supposed to be sexual, and to tell people that it's not okay, that they can only do it within certain confines, it's, it's not okay. Um, they're doing, like, abstinence-only educators will stand in front of a room and they'll unwrap, unwrap a lollipop and they'll suck on it and try to put the wrapper back on. And here's where you have this, like, image here. If you've been unwrapped once, you can't be unwrapped again. You're a piece of candy that's been chewed up and spit on and you can't wrap that back up and no one wants a piece of candy that's been chewed on and spit. Uh, <sighs> What is that telling people about their sexuality? Like, how, how can we not think that that's not sending a terrible, horrible message, to, especially to young people who are very readily uh, available to be influenced? Um, so it's just not, it's not good. Um, when I say distorting information about condoms and sexually transmitted infections, that's just a polite way of me saying they're lying, they're full of crap, this is none of this, hardly any of the information they give is actually factual. Um, they actually are tied, absence only programs are tied in with crisis pregnancy centers. And if you've never heard of a crisis pregnancy center, you can find them everywhere. There are way more crisis pregnancy centers in this country than there are abortion clinics. And crisis pregnancy centers are run by, uh, usually by religious groups, um, and they will oftentimes put themselves near an abortion clinic um, advertising free uh, pregnancy testing. So if you're right, if someone says, oh yeah, no, go to the clinic on Main Street, and you pull up to a clinic that's right next to a real health clinic, and you're like, oh, this is also a health clinic. And people are walking in and thinking that they're getting medical care, and they're not. They're walking into a church group that has false information on sexually transmitted infections, that's lying about birth control, saying that the pill kills. There's actually a website, thepillkills.com. It's terrifying, um, just full of Jesus. Um, and it doesn't help anyone. It, they're lying. They're not giving people the right information. Um, Another thing people don't realize is that gender stereotypes can be really damaging. Um, and and abstinence-only programs are constantly telling people that this is what men do, and this is what women do, and that's it. 
leaves no room for variance. And we know that um, there have been st we've done studies, and um, adolescent boys who uh, subscribe to a more traditional idea of gender roles tend to have more sexual partners. They don't use condoms as often. They're not using any other form of birth control. Their relationships are much more unequal, um, and it's just they're not going to clin they're not getting health care when they need it. There's this idea that um, the only what when you're a man you're strong and getting an infection is weakness. Being sick is being weak. So they're hoping that the infection will go away on its own and they're really hurting themselves. So this is dangerous. Um, not only is it just wrong, but it's really, really hurting people. Um, and of course, they are lying about sexual orientation. Um, they're saying it's not okay to be a single parent. This is a huge problem. Um, they're saying um, that abortion hurts women way more than um, then is I mean, abortion doesn't even need to come up a lot of times, and, and especially when you're talking to um, young children. And that's, you know, it's not a topic that you really need to be covering that often with, with kids. And they are um, being very political in their presentations. Um, so this is, a, this is an example. I just wanted to give you a quick example. And I'm sorry, it's at the bottom of the screen, so some of you might not be able to see it. Um, this comes from Abstinence Clearinghouse. The Abstinence Clearinghouse is one of the biggest authorities on abstinence in this country. They have lobbyists. They've got a crap ton of money. Um, they, are, uh, they sell like purity rings and curriculum uh, materials and things like that. And here on their website, they have like an abstinence 101, and they're talking about um, condoms down here at the bottom. It says condoms, the myth is that condoms prevent HIV, AIDS, and STDs. Condoms fail to prevent exposure to HIV and AIDS, a disease that is still 100% fatal nearly 16% of the time. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop there for a second. Um, this is purposefully confusing people. They're trying to scare people. If you see, like, that's 100% fatal? Oh, crap. Well, you know, as opposed to, like, things that are fatal, but they only kill, like, 50% of you or something like that. But, you know, but really, they're, they're trying to scare people here. And then again, they're saying that there's no scientific evidence that condoms prevent sexually transmitted infections. And that's just not even true. We know that condoms are great, that they can do a lot to help people uh, avoid infections and pregnancy. So, but I really want to focus on comprehensive sexuality education today. Um, and so just, I'm just curious, how many of you have never sat through any sort of class or presentation that gives you factual information on sexual health? Okay, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, how many of you have had like an abstinence only, um, you got an abstinence only course? And how many of you feel like you got a really great presentation from someone or a really great class where you were given really awesome information? You. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. okay, so now today, at the end of it, all of you will be able to raise your hands and say, I had this great presentation, this lady was awesome, it was fantastic. Um, but I want to stress that sex education is way more than the birds and the bees. A lot of people think, I say, oh I'm a, yeah, I'm a sexual health educator. And they think, oh, so you talk about condoms and birth control. Well, yeah, I do, but I also talk about a lot of other things, um, and that's what I'm going to go over here next. Um, so what is real sex ed? What is comprehensive sexuality education? It's so many things, and they're so awesome. Um, so real sex ed is evidence-based. You know, we're using research. We are doing, we're using the scientific method to find that, this information and present it to people. Um, it's a lifelong process. Um, a lot of people got really mad, like in Chicago, they decided they were going to start doing sex ed in kindergarten. And I got really excited, I was like, awesome! And what, and, but there are a lot of people who are like, my kid doesn't need to know about condoms in kindergarten. Well, that's absolutely correct, your kid doesn't need to know about condoms in kindergarten. What they do need to know is what the proper names are for their body parts, so that if someone ever touches them there, they can say, so-and-so touched my penis. Not so and so touched my pigeon, as it was called in my family. Um, somehow, somehow, I think I started calling it that, and it really didn't get corrected. So I, there was a lot of confusion with my classmates. I'd be like, "Yeah, like I saw his pigeon," and they're like, "What the hell is this chick talking about? Like you saw it like a bird? I don't know." But so it's really important the kids know the right names for their body parts. Um, Vagina is not a dirty word. It's the name of a body part. 
Penis isn't a bad word. That's what they're called. Like that is these that is the medical word for these things. And the kids need to be able to say these things to their doctors. Adults, you need to be able to say to your doctor, I have this bump on the glands of my penis. If you don't know what that means, look it up or ask me. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, but it's also age appropriate, like I'm saying with that Chicago thing. I'm not, you know, actually young kids should know where babies come from. Don't lie to your kids um, about like a stork or there's that terrible commercial where there's like a baby planet or something and like they get sent down. And when your child realizes that you've lied to them about something as basic as where did I come from? They get this idea immediately that sex isn't something I can talk to mom and dad about, or mom and mom about, or dad and dad about, or just mom or just dad. You know, um, you want to be you want to be giving your child the signal that I'm someone you can talk to. I want to give you information. If you don't have an answer, say you don't know. Let's look it up. Um, so um, it is also comprehensive, of course. Um, it seems a little redundant, but uh, we talk about body image. A lot of people don't understand like why would body image be part of sexuality education. Well, sexuality means more than just like sexual orientation. That's what a lot of people think when I say sexuality. They think I'm talking about gay, straight, bi, um, pan, sexual, all these other things. Um, but no, we're talking about you as a sexual being and there are so many things that go into that. And for body image, how you feel about your body um, can have a lot of implications on your sexual health. Um, so we've done studies on adolescent uh, girls, and we found that when they have lower self-esteem and they have poor body image, they feel like they don't have access to as many partners, so they're more likely to just kind of take whatever comes to them, and then they don't negotiate condom use. They don't talk about birth control. Um, so we're having more teen pregnancies um, because girls don't feel good about their bodies, actually, which is really strange um, if you don't you know, know the science of it. Um, we talk about gender identity, you know, so sex and gender are two different things. You know, sex has to do with biology, the chromosomes that you have, um, and gender is how you present those chromosomes. And some people choose, or some people want to present them in another way, or they feel like they want, they present them in a different way, and that's fine. Um, but teaching kids that you, you just because you're a girl doesn't mean you have to wear dresses, and boys can have long hair, or they can have short hair, or they can have no hair, um, and that's fine. Um, what else we have up here? Sexual orientation is part of it. Um, teaching, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about sexual orientation that uh, not only teenagers have these misconceptions, but also adults. I spend a lot of time doing LGBT 101 presentations. Where we're just learning what do these words mean? Like what does intersex mean? Or um, what, what is this word queer that I keep hearing? And is that a bad word to say or not? So we talk about these things. Um, Sexual health and reproduction. So that's the birds and the bees. That's talking about birth control. That's talking about condoms. Um, where do babies come from? What does what fetal development look like? Um, how, how are babies born? That's all really important. Um, and then love and relationships. A lot of kids aren't getting information about what a healthy relationship looks like. They think it's okay for their partner to ask for their Facebook password, um, or for their partner to um, not, you know, not agree with any of their ideas, or that it's okay to fight all the time. Um, and those are bad signs usually, but a lot of young people think that you're supposed to fight, um, and that hitting is okay sometimes. Uh, and, and relationships also, that has to do with your family even. Um, when, a, when a baby is born, they're immediately in a relationship with the family that cares for it and they're learning that they're loved and that there are people there to take care of them. That's part of being sexual. Um, and then sexual responsibility, which is, I think, probably the biggest part of this for me, is talking about consent. Um, Consent should be part of every single sexual activity that you ever engage in. You want to know that the person you're with or the people you're with agree with what you're doing. They are into it. They like it. They're giving an enthusiastic yes. Um, a hesitant yes is not consent. Silence is not consent. Um, going to a party is not consent to sexual intercourse. And a lot of people are confused about that. And it's really unfortunate. Um, but this is also part of like learning what are the sex laws in your state. You know, what is the age of consent? Um, who can consent? Who can't? Um, and this is really, really important. Um, but uh, to sort of wrap this up, I want to say that I don't teach sex ed because I think, oh, well, kids, kids are going to have sex. I mean, they're just going to do it. You got to teach it. Well, yeah, that's true. But I teach about sexuality education because it's okay to have sex. There's nothing wrong with having sex. 
great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about abstinence. <laughs> It's only 99.99999% effective, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, but really, yeah. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is really important. Um, abstinence is part of comprehensive sexuality education. Um, it is okay to be abstinent. You don't have to do things you don't want to do. If you're not ready, you're not ready, and that's fine. Um, but what's happening when, when uh, presenters just talk about abstinence, kids think, oh, well, that's a penis and a vagina having sex, and as long as I'm not doing that, I'm okay. So kids who receive abstinence-only education end up having a lot more anal sex and a lot more oral sex, not realizing that there are actually some greater risks there. Um, like, anal sex can be very dangerous, especially if you're not using a condom or enough lubricant. Um, and I'm going to guess that an abstinence-only educator isn't up here talking about lubricants. Um, so that's an issue. Um, a common misconception. So this is something I hear all the time. People say, well, Emily, if I have a sexually transmitted infection, I'm going to know it. There's going to be bumps down there. It's going to hurt when I pee. It's gonna, I'm going to be in a lot of pain. There's going to be weird discharge. Nope. The most common symptom or sign of sexually transmitted infections is no symptom at all. Um, so like with chlamydia, which is one of the most common bacterial sexually transmitted infection in the United States, 75% um, of women and 50% of men never have a symptom. They never have any pain, they never have any weird discharge, they just kind of show up to the clinic because their partner said, hey, you want to get tested? And they're like, oh crap, I had chlamydia? I had no idea. I didn't feel anything. Um, so it's really important to get tested regularly. Um, so, putting on a condom, this is something, I do a lot of condom demonstrations, um, and I'm, I'm not going to do a full one for you here today, but um, there are little steps that people forget. Uh, for instance, you have to store your condoms in the right place. It needs to be some place that's not too hot, not too cold. Um, so, your car is a terrible place for condoms to be sitting. Um, like recently, so, so when, I'm doing, when I'm doing presentations, I oftentimes have to take the condoms home with me and I'm, I need to go up to my apartment, I'm going to bed for the night. So, I have to take my condoms upstairs with me. And I've been carrying them in a glass vase. And recently, I was walking through the parking lot of my apartment complex and I dropped the glass vase. <laughs> And I had glass and condoms everywhere. So this is, this is a battle of cape. First of all, my condom safety has been compromised. Like, there are shards of glass all over the place. These are going to be presentation condoms from now on. But then there's, uh, there's also the aspect of my neighbors hearing glass break, and they run down to help me with brooms. <laughs> and there was just some awkward silence there. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a sex ed teacher. Oh. Okay. I was like, yeah, no, I just had a presentation. I just, was just bringing them inside. I'm definitely not running a brothel or anything in my apartment. That's not what's happening. Um, but, yeah. no, I joke. I was, I was very like, serious with this one. I was like, yeah, no, I teach sex ed. I give out condoms. I was just very frank about it. Um, but so don't put them in your wallet. That's actually, we see that in like TV shows and movies all the time. And that's horrible for condoms. Like think about a wallet opening and closing all the time. That's a lot of friction on that package and that can really hurt, your, hurt, hurt the latex in there. So um, I suggest a hard case wallet, like one of those aluminum wallets, um, or you can actually buy condom cases. They're really cheap. Uh, for women, it's really easy to throw in your purse. For men, if you have bigger pockets, it's really easy. Um, if you really want to carry a condom loose in your pocket, that's okay as long as, long as it's not for too long and you're not like sitting on it, things like that. Um, there's supposed to be an air bubble in that package. A lot of people don't know that. That air bubble is going to tell you that your condom hasn't been punctured or accidentally torn or anything like that. Um, and how this happens sometimes, like if you get your condoms in a strip, you need to tear these apart ahead of time. Don't wait till the heat of the moment to separate your condoms. Um, because if you're just, just ripping them apart, you might rip into that next condom that you weren't planning to use. And you might not even realize it. Um, so when you ch are checking, you squeeze these condoms, you can feel an air bubble and you want that. Um, and this is another thing that's it's minor, but it can be really important. Um, so condoms are 98% effective against pregnancy but they have to be used consistently and correctly. And that includes all these steps. So if you aren't storing your condom in the right place, it's not gonna be 98% effective. If you don't push the condom over in the side of the pack 
so that when you open it, the, the uh, foil isn't tearing into the latex, you're gonna, you're not, it's not going to be as effective. Um, so it's really important to be reading those instructions in your condom packs. Make sure you know what's going on there. But Emily, aren't condoms too small for some men's penises? No. In general, I, I will give like a little asterisk here. Where I'm like, okay, we'll find some times. But um, to demonstrate this, I'm going to need a volunteer from the audience. <laughs> no, but really, I need a volunteer from the audience. Anybody? I see your hand first. Come on up. Let's give them a round of applause. Can someone tell me how much time I have while he's coming up here? Because I don't know when I started. So when I have 15 minutes left, which it might be right now, let me know. All right, I got to put my mic down. All right, so this is a, a regular size condom. This is not an extra large condom. Um, can you make a fist for me? Perfect. But oh, it's a blue condom, too. Raise it straight. Step, step this way. I actually, actually broke this condom. I've been doing this for a long time. I have only broken a condom one other time, and it was because the condom was expired. So um, this, I got it with my fingernail. So this is a lesson learned. Don't cut it with your finger. Don't snag things with your fingernails. But usually when I do this, we get full coverage here. Um, there are no tears. Don't, don't look down here. Um, and and this, this is the thing I demonstrate. I don't know anyone with a penis this large. <laughs> and if you do, call 911. No, like get them some help. Um, you know, or congratulations, no. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll go ahead and you can, take, you can pull that off. And I have, I have wet wipes for you. Um, <laughs> thanks, let me know if you need another one. I'll take that. Um, thanks, yeah. It's, Great. Um, yeah, that's always a lot of fun. I can't believe I broke the condom. That never happens. But condoms aren't perfect. They do have a 2% failure rate, so maybe this was that 2%. Um, average male penis size is um, about five and a half to six inches when erect. Um, and the average size of a vagina is like three inches. So when people are talking to me about penis size, I'm like, if I'm having sex with a woman, is it going to, like, does, she, does it need to be bigger? No. It's fine. Um, and I didn't get to ask, but was that like too tight? Oh, he, he's he gone? Oh, he, he wanted to wash the lube off? <laughs> Weak. <laughs> I, I've gotten to the point where it's my moisturizer. Like, I don't even try to wipe it off anymore. Um, although, there's definitely some lube on this microphone now. So, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so. If, although if you do happen to be some part of that small percentage of men that do need special sizing in your condoms, which it does happen, there are men who need smaller condoms and men who do need larger condoms, um, you want to go to condomania.com. is just one of many websites that's fantastic. It will actually show you all the brands of condoms and you can pick which has the best size for you. I mean, you can get like a kind of a gift basket that gives you tons of sizes so you can experiment with them. Um, so that's good to know. Um, i just going to briefly just mention that female condoms exist. A lot of people don't know that female condoms are a thing. Um, they're not as effective against pregnancy. Um, they're about, when they're used perfectly, they're 95% effective against pregnancy. So five out of 100 couples will get pregnant after a year. Um, but there are some benefits. They're not made out of latex. Um, the, the ring on the edge here can stimulate the clitoris, which we like. Um, it, also, this can be used for anal sex, so it's a good way to protect yourself that way. Um, they can be a little bit more expensive and harder to find, um, but here's the gist. If you would like more information about female condoms, come find me afterwards. I've got like a, a vagina model over here. I'd be willing to do a demo for you. Um, people don't know they need to protect themselves during oral sex, but you totally need to protect yourself during oral sex. You can get herpes that way. Um, HPV, which we're finding is causing some oral cancers. Um, you need to be protecting yourself. Um, you could actually get gonorrhea in your throat as well. Um, but what do you do if you don't have a dental dam? These are hard to find sometimes. Like, so this is what it looks like. So it's like a, just a sheet of latex. Very, 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 very stretchy. 
Um, very, very effective. You're putting a barrier between your mouth and someone else's genitals. Um, but if you don't have a dental dam because they are hard to find in stores, what do you do? Okay, so saran wrap can be an answer. It has to be non-microwave safe. So if it can go in the microwave, don't use it to protect yourself. That means it's porous um, and sexually transmitted infections can get through there. So if it's microwave safe, eh. Um, but what I like better is uh, there are two methods you can make your own dental dam. Um, so here you're just taking a condom, cutting it uh, just at the radius. You end up with this little smiley face and you unroll that and you have a sheet of latex. Um, don't use condoms with spermicides on them for this. It numbs the mouth a little bit. Um, just be careful there. Um, but this is actually my favorite method, um, and this is taking um, a, excuse me, sorry with the microphone thing, um, this is taking a glove, it can be latex or a latex alternative, and you cut off the four fingers and then you cut up the pinky, and when you open it up, you have this large sheet that actually, ha it's three dimensional, so. <laughs> really awesome, fingers, tongues, whatever, you know, uh, protect yourself. I show this image to adults, I show this to teenagers, and, I, and I, I, I take my laser pointer and I point to this little purple area right here, and I say, what part of the body is this? This is a female internal reproductive system, what is this? Someone tell me what this is, shout it out. Vagina, Vagina yes! Grown adults who are sexually active don't know that this is the vagina. This is the vagina. I mean, this is huge. That's what the vagina is. I mean, uh, you know, statistically, more people are having heterosexual sex than, you know, than the al alternatives. Um, but that's the vagina. You should know where that is. And I'm scared that people don't know. I mean, these are women who haven't, they've given birth before. And they don't know that that's their vagina. They're getting confused. They think that this is the vagina, when the vagina is actually just is the actual canal itself. This is actually the vulva. Um, and while we're here, clitoris. Take note. <laughs> clitoris, good. Clitoris, good. Um, and I want to know, like earlier, we're talking about it feels good when I rub it. That's called masturbation, and I want us to be comfortable with that word. It's called masturbation. It's okay to say it. Um, masturbation, masturbation, masturbation. Um, it's okay. It's healthy. It's normal. You can do it. You can not do it. You're normal either way. Um, and also, I wanted to point the mons pubis. This is interesting. This is also called the mons veneris, or the mound of Venus. So Venus, the goddess of love, the, the mound of love. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, Cool. Uh, people always ask me, what is the most effective form of birth control? And that's actually a really hard question. And this chart makes it look really simple, but, but this is a chart that's showing typical use with these methods. Um, and, and really, when we're talking about like the shot or the pill um, or, or the uh, Nuva ring, I have it on a retractable belt clip. That's how nerdy I am. Um, the the Nuva ring, like these these methods, are actually 99% effective when you use them the correct way. However, with typical use, what people are actually doing, there end up being you know two to nine pregnancies per 100 couples every year. Um, and so if you have any questions about these methods of birth control, I have a demo of every single one of them. Um, if you want to see what it looks like, you want to feel uh, feel what it feels like. Uh, a little redundant, but um, come find me. Birth in general, we've got, I mean, we've got methods that are 99% effective or over 99%, so there's no reason to get pregnant when you don't want to. You have control over your fertility. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, I think. I, I, I want to get to questions, um, but I know you guys all know that this is a myth. Emergency contraception does the same thing that other hormonal birth controls do. Um, it stops ovulation, it thickens cervical mucus, um, and so it, it stops fertilization from ever happening in the first place. Um, this is my last one before I get to your questions. How can I have safer sex with my sex toys? Um, this is something that you have to talk about. Um, because a lot of people are using toys in the bedroom. Or um, one problem with abstinence-only education is that the educator thinks they're talking to a room of straight people. These are people that are just, have, they're in missionary position, you know, having sex as a man and a woman, and they're married, and it's perfect, and Jesus is watching, and it's great. <laughs> um, and, but really, people are using toys, especially people in the LGBT community, you know, I mean, toys are, are especially part of that. And that's awesome, that's fine, but there are things you need to do to be safer, um, like using condoms with them. Um, this is actually a great way, if you're gonna be switching from like anus to vagina, or from one person's anus to another person's anus, 
Put a new condom on every single time, otherwise you're mixing those fluids. Using a condom is great because then you don't have to like run to the kitchen and wash it off or whatever. You can just switch condoms. Um, using lubricants is really important for not only safer sex, but for better sex. Um, and then cleaning them. If you're, they're sitting in your drawer with bacteria on it, that's not great. Um, so avoid that. Um, and, and here's something that I, I was hesitant to maybe talk about this, but in a lot of stores, these are sold as novelty items. So like vibrators and dildos. They're novelty items, so they're actually not like approved by the FDA. So we don't really know what's going into them sometimes. Um, so this is just something to think about. There are websites you can go to where you can get organic dildos, um, where you're being green um, in your sex life. But you know, so that's just something to think about. Um, what, what is in the plastics here? Um, but we, more research needs to be done for sure. Um, so I'm going to start looking at your questions. I'm kind of afraid. I'm not going to lie. Um, how, how long do I have? Does anyone know? So I just want to kind of know. No. 10 minutes? Awesome. OK. Cool. That's great. Um, and just so you know, these are some awesome resources. Yeah, if you want to take a picture of this screen or um, ask me later about these. If you have questions and you're like, oh, it's fine. I don't need to add to her phone. These are awesome sources. Um, this is where you can find reliable information that we can trust that's evidence-based. Great. Um, so someone says, do I need to take the pill at exactly the same time every day? How does it affect um, its, well, how does it make it less or more effective? Um, so um, with progestin-only pills, it's very, very, very important to take them at the same time every day. Like you shouldn't vary, it should be like three hours is all the variance you really have there. Um, with combination pills, um, which are a little bit more popular, combination pills, you have a little bit more um, give and take there. We say take it within 12 hours at the same time every day, so it's, that's a ton of le lenience there. Um, but it's way better to be taking them at the same time. Um, and if you like throw up or something after you've taken your pill, you have diarrhea, that can affect um, that pill. You know, you could, it could be leaving the body. So keep that in mind. If you're ever unsure, talk to your doctor or use a backup method like condoms until you know that you've been, you've been taking your pill again at the right time. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the HPV vaccine and the myths about its harm? Okay, the HPV vaccine is awesome. Like, if there's a vaccine that prevents cancer, why isn't everyone taking this? Like, oh my gosh, vaccinate your children. Like, seriously, vaccinate your children, seriously. Um, so HPV vaccine, the, mo the more common one is Gardasil. There's also one called Cervarix. Um, but Gardasil protects against four different strains of HPV. Um, with HPV, there are actually over 100 different kinds. Um, and most of them don't do anything at all. They don't hurt the body. Um, some people can actually get rid of the virus on their own. Like, we'll do testing later on, and they don't even have it anymore. But there are four strains that you really need to look out for. Um, and two of them cause 70% um, of cervical cancer cases. And the other two are responsible for 90% of genital warts. I have seen genital warts. I have seen the removal process. It's not fun. Um, but you know, just because you have HPV does not mean your sex life is over. Um, that's, another, that's another part of abstinence-only education that I really hate, is that they act like if you have a sexually transmitted infection, you're gross, you're dirty. Um, and I hate when people say, oh no, I'm clean. Because having an infection doesn't make you dirty, doesn't make you impure, doesn't make you gross. Um, one in three Americans at any given time has a sexually transmitted infection. Um, most people will get HPV at some point in their lives, but usually they're not getting you know, those four strains that really suck. Um, but like, we, we need to quit stigmatizing people with STIs. Um, it's very common, and, and a lot of them are easy to get rid of. Um, actually, one in two adolescents, or sexually active adolescents, will get a sexually transmitted infection by the time they're 25. So that's 50% of the sexually active population um, that's going to get an infection. Um, and we know that like 90, over 90% of college students are sexually active. Um, and none of us are waiting for marriage. Like 5% like of the population waits until they're married to have sex. Great. Hope I answered that. Um, I think I've got time for a couple more. Oh gosh, guys, come on. <laughs> yeah, gotta, gotta make sure. Um, any advice in regards to discussing sex and where babies come from with young children? Um, this person specifically has a seven-year-old daughter. Um, so 
be honest, you know, like I said earlier, don't make up some crazy story. Um, I actually try to avoid words like, uh, like that allude to gardening. A lot of people are like, well, there's seed in it and then eggs. And that, because kids are very literal. When you say seed, they're really picturing a seed. When you say egg, they're picturing like a bird egg. And that can be very, very confusing. Um, it's okay to show them, you know, pictures of the reproductive system. Um, show them pictures, like medically accurate pictures that are designed for children. Um, don't show them on your own body, please. Um, <laughs> I know you laugh, but it's, um, it's very serious things have happened with parents who thought they were helping their kids to just show them, and it, they've ended up in jail. So I, you know, use, use pictures, find books that are, that are medically accurate. Um, but, you know, you don't, have, well, you, don't have, you don't have to say, well, a man and a woman love each other very much. You know, um, definitely, you say, well, it takes sperm, and it takes a woman's egg, and they join together, and that, um, it's hard to say, you say implant, and they are immediately thinking of gardening again. Um, but, and, you know, let them know babies come from, from mom's uterus. Um, I hope that answers that. It's really, it's actually, oh, great, I should give you a great resource. Noplacelikehome.org. Noplacelikehome.org. Amazing website for parents or for anyone who works with children. Um, you can actually click like, oh, my kid is seven, and it will give you a whole long list of things you can talk to your kid about, um, how to talk about like pregnancy and things like that, and what you should be talking about at every age. Noplacelikehome.org. So it's like, there's no place like home for sex education, is their slogan. Um, but schools are good too. It's hard for parents to talk. Is there a difference between calling them STIs and STDs? Great, I, I wanted to talk about this, but I wasn't sure I was gonna have time. Um, so, sexually transmitted disease versus sexually transmitted infection. Um, medically, we call something a disease when it has signs or symptoms. And like I said earlier, most sexually transmitted infections don't have a sign or a symptom. People don't know that they have the infection, um, and so they are just infected with it. It's not actually um, giving them these signs and symptoms that we classify as a disease. Um, but the word STD is not leaving, and that's fine. Um, most people know what you're talking about when you say STD. Um, STI tends to be a little bit uh, more popular in Europe, um, and we try, we're trying to destigmatize these uh, diseases Calling them infections makes people feel a little bit better. Um, and because a lot of them, they are very easy to clear up. So we don't like scaring people, you, you're diseased. That really freaks people out a lot. Um, let's see what we got here. OK, yeah, so let me take some questions from the audience who, like, because uh, I know there's some people who don't have text messages. So um, yes, ma'am, in the white. Can you yell it? OK. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that PPFA, that's Planned Parenthood Federation of America.org. Um, yes, yeah, if you, um, Unitarian churches have a sex, sex ed curriculum, um, and it's really great. Um, so definitely check that out if you're looking for some sort of like after school program for your kids. The UU church is, is pretty awesome. Yeah. And we put out what we call wraps. We've got good quality condoms out there, and different sizes of condoms. Yeah. When people walk by, they walk by the first time, and they're like, oh, then they walk by, and when you, as soon as you lay out the condoms, you grab them. It's the girls who go for them. And they yeah. give them as many as they want. And the boys don't. Do you see that? Yeah, okay, so she's saying that she, so she works for Planned Parenthood and they do like tabling events all the time um, and that she's finding that young women are really interested in the condoms before young men are um, and do, and have I had that similar experience in the classroom? Um, you know, it totally depends on the group. I get, I get guys who are so interested in how bir their girlfriend's birth control pill works that they will sit there and ask me questions for like 10 minutes. Um, and they're like, well, how can I help her like take her pill at the same time every day? And I say, you know what? You can have an alarm set on your phone if you want to send her a text message, say, hey, hon, do you remember your pill? That'd be totally appropriate. 
It's a great idea for, for men to be active in their girlfriend's uh, birth control. Now, and I, I sometimes am hesitant to do that because sometimes there are men who are sabotaging their partner's birth control. And again, there are women who sabotage condoms as well. Um, but for the most part, guys do want to know what's going on. Like if you don't want to be a dad right now and you know you're and you're you're having sex with women, you're worried about pregnancy, you should know how those methods work. You should know what they look like um, and you can be play an active role um, in preventing pregnancy. Um, a lot of teenagers think that pregnancy just kind of happens, that there's nothing they can do about it. And that's that's absurd to me. Like you have control over these things. Um, is there another question from the audience? Who else had questions in the audience? Yeah, you ma'am. Yeah. We have a 13 year old daughter who's looking at porn. Uh, how would you recommend I discuss that with her? I'm okay, so I'm going to take this like generally. How do you discuss um, porn with your children? Um, the, some of the, okay, so porn can be great. It can be awesome, it can be fine, it can be fantastic. Some, some feminists won't say that, I will say that. I, I enjoy porn from time to time. But the problem with mainstream porn is that it's often, um, there's not sexual equality, um, or there's not gender equality, and um, women are being demeaned a lot of the time. So I think it's really important to talk to, if you catch your kid watching, you know, ask them like, well, you know, How'd that make you feel? <laughs> um, you know, is there a reason you like watching it? Like, let's talk about the messages that it's giving. Like, where did the girl's pubic hair go? Or, um, because, you know, I know, right? I love pubic hair, it's great. It's like, it protects things. Um, but so, ta you know, talk about those things. Like, was were, were these people in a situation that was safe? Um, and I mean, unless you really, really don't want your child watching, that, that's, that's kind of young, but that's the thing. She's probably just really curious about sex. Um, and so then give her resources, like, um, you know, have her go to um, Advocates for Youth or um, sexetc.com. There's some really great websites that would, that would just, that might uh, help with the curiosity. Um, let me read one more text question and then I'm going to have to disappear. Let's see if I can find anything here. Um, oh, of course, now it's going to take me a while to... Um, what resources does Planned Parenthood offer for transgender people? Um, that's a great question. So usually we're referring people. Um, like they have, a lot of times they have educators in their clinics or like admin offices will have educators and they are great people to talk to about this. Um, they can just give you information um, on some of the issues that transgender people face, um, you know, some, uh, just, just learning the correct words and things like that. Um, but if someone is, is looking for more resources, we have those. Um, there's, um, there's almost always an educator who can point you in the right direction, um, give you, you know, people that are advocates for transgender people, um, or they can find doctors for you that are, um, that are accepting and understanding. So, thank you so much. Uh, be safe. Thank you. That's all I've got.